Welcome to the first season of the Ecologies of Danger podcast. Ecologies of Danger is a project produced by the students of a course on environmental security at Colgate University. In this season of the podcast, we look at the different ways in which the environment has become a security issue. In this episode, Maddie Clough looks into the complex geopolitics of a warming globe and a melting Arctic. We don't often think of climate change as a liberating force, but rising temperatures are melting Arctic ice and exposing previously inaccessible resources. Now there's a whole new stockpile of resources up for the taking. The opportunities are tremendous. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that the region holds up to a quarter of the Earth's undiscovered oil and natural gas. States that border the Arctic all want their fair share, and they're willing to fight for it. Or so we're told. The media has seized on the issue. We are living in a new Cold War, only one more dangerous than before. In recent months, the Kremlin has staged some of its biggest ever military exercises in the region. Russia's race ahead of the U.S. in cornering the Arctic, analysts say, is a sobering illustration of Putin's broader ambitions. These news reports are far from anomalies. The media tells us a war over Arctic resources is right around the corner, that Russia is an imminent threat. Scholars tell a different story. They claim the Arctic is a model for international cooperation. If scholars are right, why does the colder war narrative keep reappearing? Let's break down this dominant media narrative, its origins, its flaws, and its damaging consequences. The Colter War media story originates from a place of truth. Here's what we know. Russia is making moves to militarize the region. It is modernizing old military bases, building icebreakers, and reorganizing its northern fleet. And Russian scientists did plant a Russian flag under the ice of the North Pole, staking out its claim. Despite all the hype, the fact is, Arctic diplomacy is working. This is Scott Borgerson. He's a Council on Foreign Relations expert. The Arctic has a rapidly changing environment. In some cases, it has blurred borders. It has very rich natural resources. And in the past, that could lead to increased competition and perhaps military friction. However, recent years show that Arctic nations are actually working in a concerted way towards collaboration and cooperation. Countries with Arctic borders have already made huge progress in regional diplomacy. Alarmist media reports ignore this completely. And actually, all countries are in favor of cooperation, even Russia. The Kremlin's right-hand advisor, Arthur Chillingrob, emphasized that dialogue and diplomacy are Russia's top priority. When asked if he believes there's a potential for conflict in the Arctic, he responded immediately. No, no, no. There shouldn't be any conflicts in the Arctic. There's a mutual understanding in the international community that is developing fast and I believe will develop even further. Former President Obama agrees. At an Arctic conference, he addressed the other Arctic nations. We are eager to work with your nations on the unique opportunities that the Arctic presents and the unique challenges that it faces. We are not going to, any of us, be able to solve these challenges by ourselves. We can only solve them together. The Arctic countries built a framework for cooperation together. They formed the Arctic Council to discuss regional issues and settle disputes. All Arctic nations also signed the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOSE. UNCLOSE promotes a commitment to Arctic cooperation and international law. Many Arctic disagreements have already been settled cooperatively. Examples of successful treaties include a multilateral fishing moratorium that was signed just a few years ago. This move drastically reduced tensions in the region. In 2010, Russia and Norway also settled a 40-year squabble over the Barren Sea. In a surprising victory, the two countries divided the territory equally. 
Successful agreements like these show just how flawed the Colder War narrative is. They make scholars and politicians optimistic about remaining disagreements. At an Arctic forum, Putin stated that the Arctic is the ideal place for dialogue and cooperation, reaffirming that I'm absolutely sure that all the existing problems, including the ones over the continental shelf, can be resolved in a manner of partnership and according to the law. So even the Kremlin is optimistic about disputes over exploitable territory. Many thought that these would lead to the most intense disagreements, but these fears were overstated. Studies show that the vast majority of resources fall into undisputed territories, and Arctic countries don't seem keen to argue over the remaining crumbs. It turns out the Arctic is not some Cold War disaster in the making. The real disaster is the media. Western and Russian media alike are harming diplomacy efforts. This is one damaging consequence of how the media frames Arctic stories. On the Russian side, media can be boiled down to nationalist propaganda. Vice reporter Shane Smith laid out the problem. 90% of Russians get their news primarily from television, and the state controls all three of the main TV channels. And in reality, the Kremlin has a heavy influence over the entire media industry. Putin directly manipulates the media and uses it for social control. Former President Obama was quite critical about this. What Putin's doing with state-run media and the suppression of civil society and the suppression of the internet and the suppression of dissenting voices is obviously entirely different from what's happening here. Ordinary Russians aren't getting good information. There's no check on what Putin may do. We all know Russia is a propaganda machine, but are we so different? Does the media really function as a check on the government? It's hard to tell. What we do know is that profit is a top priority. The media publishes stories that sell. These tend to be dramatic doomsday tales that are sure to catch people's attention. The media capitalizes off lingering Cold War fears. It creates a common enemy, Russia, and instills fear that World War III is right around the corner. News reporters say we're not ready for this war, including Fox correspondent Dan Springer. So if you think of this as an Arctic arms race, Russia has lapped the United States twice. They are way ahead militarily, and they are also ahead in taking advantage of the economic opportunities. The media makes calls for the American government to wake up and to protect our people and our allies. It begs the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, to get involved. Oversimplified media stories are a real danger. Inflammatory rhetoric can exacerbate existing geopolitical tensions. They're particularly damaging because they can influence the way both the U.S. and Russia act in the region. In an attempt to secure our Arctic interests, media hype could lead the U.S. government to take counterproductive measures. These could agitate Russia and even provoke an unintended response. We cannot play into alarmist fears and militarize the Arctic. NATO has no place there. Some claim that NATO involvement doesn't have to be military. The Norwegian foreign minister is one of these voices. The Arctic is one of those neighborhoods uh, that is, uh, should be of uh, great interest to the uh, alliance. Not because it is in any type of crisis or drama, rather the other way around. This is an area of cooperation. Despite this optimism, NATO is still a military organization. Its involvement would bring the Cold War to the forefront of Arctic relations. With all four border states in NATO except Russia, it could be interpreted as an attempt to contain it, whether that's the intention or not. Russia greatly distrusts NATO, and its involvement would only escalate tensions. It would turn the perceived Russian threat into a real one. So what should we do? The U.S. should consider other routes to keep the cooperative ball rolling in the Arctic. We already have a better alternative to NATO. It's called the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or the OSCE. All Arctic states participate in the OSCE, which would encourage inclusivity and cooperation, not confrontation. It's a security framework like NATO, but it's much better equipped to solve the Arctic's unique problems. This is because it's not limited to political and military issues. It captures economic, environmental, and human dimensions, which are essential for Arctic diplomacy. Arctic relations are just beginning, 
introducing organizations like the OSCE will set the stage for future collaboration. The region has huge potential for growth and cooperation, but it's all of our responsibility to forge this pathway to peace. This is Maddie Clough at Colgate University.